Okay. Pushed all the buttons. We should now be streaming. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Astro Coffee. My name is Tony Darnell. You're watching the Deep Astronomy channel on YouTube. And it's Thursday at 3 o'clock, which means Dr. Brian Keating is with us to talk about some of the cool stuff that he's been doing on his channel. Let me bring him up here. Hey, Dr. Brian Keating. How are you doing today? I am great, Tony. It's always a good day when I can make contact with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, well, it's good that I can do it with you as well. So you've been talking to lots <laughs> of famous people lately, and not lately, but for quite a while. And um, we, we're doing this uh, in an effort to let you guys know watching the Deep Astronomy channel that you can subscribe to Dr. Brian Keating's channel. So please do that. There is a link in the description box. There's also all the things, uh, the the full a link to the full interview that we're going to introduce you to today. And so let's go ahead and get started. Oh, I should let you know we're streaming on Brian's channel as well as my channel. And I'm looking at the chat on mine. And I, I assume that you are looking at the chat on yours, Brian. Am I right? Yeah, I okay. see it. Uh, I see so it ask us mine. questions and do things. Uh, we're, what's going to happen is we're going to, he's going to, uh, Brian has to go after about 30 minutes. I'll stick around after the fact and ramble and chat with you guys a bit more and talk about whatever you want. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So Brian, tell us what is new in the world of Dr. Brian Keating land? <laughs> Well, it started off, as you remember, my pandemic podcast began with the realization that all these famous authors and brainiacs and thinkers would be all cooped up over the next few months due to this COVID-19 emergency that we're all suffering through all over the world, literally. <clears throat> and uh, it started to make me wonder if I could be of service to them and also selfishly serve my own interest in talking <laughs> to these brilliant minds. And so I realized that I could do so by leveraging uh, my meager resources here at the UC San Diego <laughs> to make a uh, to make the podcast uh, more of a focus on books and authors and thinkers, and I was able to reach out to some of the luminaries who just so happened to be making a lot of news and noise with new ideas, particularly in theoretical physics, where we've talked about Stephen Wolfram, we talked a little bit about Mario Livio and some new ideas that might be old again or old ideas that might be new again. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Uh, mm -hmm. but, the, um, but also thinking about how uh, new, really kind of controversial ideas, such as that of Eric Weinstein and others might be of interest to, uh, to my audience and specifically to me. And uh, so I asked uh, through my, you know, he's a friend of mine, Eric Weinstein, I've met him before, and he's the managing director of Peter Thiel's uh, hedge fund, basically, his, cow, his venture capital fund called Thiel Capital, and that's his day job. But he's a, he's a mathematical uh, who's trained at Harvard, PhD in mathematics. And he has some very controversial theories about how the universe could be organized in a way that could demonstrate, uh, once and for all, a true honest-to-goodness theory of everything. And I wanted to understand that, but also to kind of press him where I feel like he needs to be challenged a little bit. And that was, uh, that was my goal in our podcast interview, which aired about a week and a half ago. All right. And we're going to show a clip from that interview here in just a minute, but what did you, what does he need to be pressed on? Just for, what do you think? What do you, what do you think he's, uh, well, he's got. So the main challenge is that he's, he's an outsider. He's very famous, very popular from his work online and really being a pundit and a deep thinker, but he has almost nothing published. And to the extent that he does, it's on a blog or on his, his own podcast called The Portal, which is quite, um, which is quite uh, phenomenal. But, uh, but I put a link uh, to that in my description box, too. So just so you know, go ahead. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> so for us to really have a chance to pour over ideas, most physicists want to see something published, whether it's a book, whether it's a paper. And more than that, they want to see a refereed published journal article. And I pointed out that, um, you know, in the case of Stephen Wolfram, the same exact charges were leveled at him, even though his ideas have been published for a long time. So I think the main controversy is that he's, he's kind of criticizing the Academy of Physics, which Wolfram does not. Uh, Weinstein's basically claiming that there's been a real dearth of progress for the last 50 years in theoretical physics. And he makes a connection between that and the baby boomer generation and is you know, kind of pressing some nerves. And uh, some of that we discussed in the clip, I think, that you're about to show. 
Well, yeah, and I think he's right. I mean, really, let's think about it for a minute. What big new ideas have come out? Not, I would say more than just 50 years, but let's go back, uh, you know, 100 years, 19, 1920s. Uh, we had some really breakthrough ideas, but really, since relativity, what have we what have what what's 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 happened really we, uh, everything that's well, happened since then has been confirming things that that einstein predicted gravitational waves being i think among the latest of them um but really what new ideas are there string theory i mean well, there, there are a lot there are that. actually a lot i i think <clears throat> i think you're being a little harsher than he is uh in setting the time scale <laughs> for kind of <laughs> uh for the for the decline and fall set, of the physics empire set me to straight the 1920s. Brian. actually there are many people who date it exactly to November of 1974 when something called the JSI revolution took place. So that, that's almost exactly 50, you know, it's 40, what, 46 years ago. Uh, that, you know, revolution really in some people's minds marked the end of progress in theoretical particle phys physics. And there were many great proposals for things like string theory, supersymmetry, Etc. But those have not borne fruit, and so he takes great issue with those developments and feels that those developments have dominated the field like a guru, like a like a Svengali that's putting so much pressure on young physicists to toe the line to try to make a string theory work. And and there's really no real productivity in his mind. He claims that this this is not the way we should be doing science. So it's, he's saying it with uh, reference only to particle theory. Okay. And some people say he has a real point, but to answer your question, there's many developments since the 1920s. Oh, I mean, okay. Theory. So, but I'm talking theoretically. Yeah. Yes, we've discovered exoplanets. Oh. We've discovered uh, we, we've we've imaged black holes. We've done a lot. That's not my point. My point yeah. is what really new foundational physics has been created. A lot. A lot. And oh, a tremendous amount. Well, I, mean, I don't look, know. In the last oh. ten years. Okay. Yeah, well, 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 I mean, I would, I would take issue. I mean, okay. things like quantum field theory, the quark model, uh, are we talking about, and these are all things since. Uh, these not are brand new. These are brand new things that yeah. have just okay. quantum holography. Or, we're talking about teleportation. Uh, we're talking about obviously the, the perturbation theory for cosmological observables, uh, dark, uh, dark energy. Uh, you know, um, uh, discoveries that lead to new models that have connections to things called in, in quantum field theory. So there's been a lot, but, but, but don't let them off the hook so easily because it is true. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you know, my, in theory, it has been relatively uh, in the particle theorists. And now they're asking for trillions, you know, billions of dollars, not trillions, uh, a lot of trillions going around these days, but billions, yeah. tens of billions of dollars to build a new advanced accelerator. And there's no promise that we'll see anything new. And so I think he has a point. Yeah, and I okay. Well, let me, let's go ahead and play this clip, and we may maybe we'll yeah. come back to this little topic. But I know you yeah, and I are simpatico should. on the culture of science and the way in which some yes. of these some of these institutions need a little bit of work. But I'm you're right. I'm a little bit harsher, I think, on science overall. Like I don't like I just want to see the money. But let me let me uh, let me let me play this clip <laughs> yeah, you gave us, yeah. and we'll we'll talk later. There's nothing more important, in my opinion for the pres preservation of humanity than theoretical physics. Yeah, you think it's actually culturally relevant to the s survival of a, of a society? If so, how did we do without it, you know, until the 1940s or so, 1930s? It's, it's necessary for the survival of humanity for a couple of different reasons, which, which have to be pulled apart. The first of which is theoretical physics is unique in the sense that it somehow trains the pure mental facility and the gritty mental facility to work together like nothing else we've ever discovered. I'm not saying it's not, not possible to duplicate it again, but even relative to mathematicians who I could make an argument might even be smarter in a certain kind of technical sense, the power of the hybrid vig vigor of pure cleanliness and pure grit uh, produced something where we never knew that the human mind was capable of those flights, as we've seen in theoretical physics. So I really believe that if you wanted to talk about, you know, the gym that trains bodies to be at their peak, well, for the mind, that's theoretical physics, the fundamental physics at that. That's the dojo. All right. It's the dojo. And All right, so... Uh, wow. Okay. I didn't understand a lot of that. Uh, grit. What is the, what, what does he mean by that? 
Oh, hang on. I can't hear <laughs> sorry. You. I think oh, he's talking go. about, uh, no, sorry. I'm muted. Oh. So there, there's a sense that uh, in theoretical physics, unlike observational astronomy, unlike experimental physics, that there tends to be a dominant personality or cult of personalities. And the ones that he speaks about most often are people like Ed Witten um, or Kamran Bafa at Harvard, Ed Witten at the Institute for Advanced Study. These are the tastemakers. These are the, these are the bringers of the fire that hold the torch that physicists are expected to cleave to. It's not like you can go to the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton and say, well, I've got this great idea as Eric does for you know, some, uh, some what's called geometric unity, and I'm going to transform the fundamentals of it. No, you're going to be working underneath a faculty advisor as a postdoc or as a graduate student. And uh, only when you have gotten to a certain level of uh, success and originality, creativity, and built your own brand, then you can start working for yourself. And what he's saying is that to survive that, takes this resiliency, which I think he's calling grit. I think that's what he means. Isn't that? Okay. Very few people have that, right? You, you can't, we're not Einsteins and, and, and we're not Weinsteins, uh, but we're, you know, it, it's very rare. And <laughs> I just realized that's like a very close talk, last name. <laughs> yeah, that's how I remember how to say it. Uh, just add a W. Okay. Uh, he doesn't want like Epstein. Or, you know, yeah, yeah. Harvey uh, Weinstein and Weinstein. Right. That's cool. Okay. So, all right. I get that now. Thank you. And so, um, his statement about, um, uh, theoretical f physics being so necessary, um, uh, I think I, I, I see where that's coming from, but, but, um, do you feel like, do you agree with that statement? First of all, that how important theoretical physics is? I, I believe that physics in general is incredibly important. I think that we, as he calls us, he calls the theoretical physics community SEAL Team 6 of the mind. So I actually know people on SEAL Team 6, so they're very brilliant. So I, I don't want to you know, say that they're not as intellectually capable as, as any physicist I know. But he's basically making the point <clears throat> that, um, you know, that we are these problem solvers that have really revealed the, the closest and the most deep attributes to truth that could possibly exist. Um, I also broaden that to experimentalists because I think actually experimentalists are the ones that are capable of, of proving or disproving that these models that are thought of by theorists are actually correct. So I point to uh, an event that happened in 2016. Do you remember after the Higgs boson was announced that all these uh, people got really excited about this new signal that came up and it had like one in a million chance of being right by chance and it was called the dye photon and it had these weird properties, maybe it could be dark matter, maybe it could Anyway, there are 500 papers written in the span of about six months, and then it went away uh, completely, and then you don't even hear about it anymore. And so I think it's easy in some sense to create uh, a theory, to come up with a theory that explains things. Uh, just this week, yesterday, in fact, I talked to a good friend of mine, Abby Vierreg, who's a professor at U Chicago. She doesn't have a book, but we, we just did a podcast about this result that you might have seen in the New York Post that uh, this experiment in Antarctica saw evidence for parallel universes uh, where time goes backwards. And it was, um, it was so overblown God, and nonsensical no. that I had yeah. to talk to somebody who actually built the experiment. Because I knew if I just talked to theorists, they will cherry pick it, right? And so that's what happened with this guy photon. And I think this happens much more commonly in theoretical physics than in experimental physics. Um. <clears throat> So sorry, my truck is ready to be picked up. <laughs> um, so the uh, uh, the 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 theoretical underpinnings then of how okay, let me let me back up a little bit. So this idea of how we do physics, how we do science, tends to be we start at this mind mindful level, like you know this this level of creativity and intelligence and imagination and the mind works out these theories right that's where they begin in some in a human mind or in a group of human minds but generally it tends to be one person and then uh, from that theories are developed and and then this would be a foundation for how physics is done do you think that we have an uh, so I've always felt like physics Especially, and astrophysics is a subgenre subgenre of that. Uh, have plenty of theorists. We have plenty of theories. What we need more of is observation and experiment. And so, um, 
what 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 do you think what would you say to that and you're speaking and, my language yeah and what do you think eric we would can say get some of that deep deep astronomy cash you know we can yeah. monetize fully monetize <laughs> our, yeah man i could our, find our coffee i could fund a parking space at the institute so <laughs> yeah cosmic cappuccino <laughs> cosmic cappuccino <laughs> that'd be me yeah <laughs> Not at UCSD. I don't know. It's pretty expensive. <laughs> that's probably um, true. Yeah, I do. I, I do. I, obviously, I agree with you. I think experiment is the true arbiter of right and wrong, and, and at least in science. However, these experiments are victims of their own success. Look, we've predicted things. We've serendipitously observed things. Now we've picked all the low-hanging fruit. And the question is, you know, what kind of tree only can survive if it has these really high-altitude fruit? that require billions of dollars, hundreds of people. There's just, and I talked with that with another author today, Sabine Hassenfelder, who wrote a book called Lost in Math that I hope we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. And that uh, thesis of that is that we shouldn't spend any more money on big experiments because there's no theoretical motivation for them to discover, say, a, a new Higgs particle or, or something beyond what we already know about. And we may be in this desert, this discovery desert, for a long time. So she is actually arguing against, and she's a physicist, she's arguing against building experiments because their cost cannot be justified according to her. Wow. I guess I hadn't thought about that. I mean, I was a little bit surprised to learn very recently, one of the members of my chat pointed this out on a Twitch stream I did, that the Large Hadron Collider only cost $4.7 billion to make. No. No, I don't think that's correct. I think it is. I didn't believe it either. Look it up. It's true. No, I think I think it's well. First of all, you always have to double every capex cost by to have operations because well, okay, people. that's what that's what Wikipedia says it costs, right? So I mean, if it's wrong, it's wrong. But I was shocked by that too because I remember when Texas was getting the superconducting super collider, Congress threw away five billion dollars before they canceled it. Right? It was about at that level. Uh, when yeah. they had already canceled it. So I was shocked to hear that too, but I did. I looked it up and that's what it said it cost. And of course, that JWST is nine, is nine billion. I don't, that's I, what, that's I don't know if that I'm was adjusted for. Yeah. yeah I, Are you I, seeing I, that? I think it's way too much. I, I looked, I mean, it's what Wikipedia says. I, I know, I know, but what else we got? But, but right? Anyway, that was from, yeah, that was from, you know, 2012, right after the discovery of the Higgs. And so it's, I, I don't think it's accurate, but uh, I, yeah, I had trouble with it too, but I couldn't say anything about it because there was the number and I'm like, well, okay, yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, and JWST by comparison is nine. So that's twice as yeah. much. And so you're like, yeah. so you're saying the cost of science, the cost of these, uh, ex these experimental verifications of the theories are getting what the return on investment is not good enough. I mean, how, how would you say it's just too expensive? On what Again, knowledge? On what on what price do you put knowledge? I mean that that seems right. So so I guess the question that Eric is at, again these aren't my arguments. I'm just uh, transmitting sure, sure. No, I understand. a message through. He would say something like, uh, you know, think of how many postdocs you could fund or graduate students you could fund uh, for the cost of the next generation collider, which is you know thirty billion dollars, and that's just to build. Uh, where there's, according to Sabine, there's no, you know, target, there's no experimental threshold. I, so I take a different tack. When there is a lower limit, so in science, you often have an upper limit. In other words, the signal can be no bigger than this or else we would have detected it. And that's where we are now with, uh, with the search for gravitational waves from inflation. The, the signal could be no, small, no larger than a certain amount, which we then translate into a, a constraints on the theory of inflation and whether or not that could be true. Next, um, the thing is, is there a lower limit? In other words, is it possible for the signal to be any smaller or is that forbidden? So take neutrinos, for example. Neutrinos are known to have a maximum mass that can't be bigger than a certain amount, but they also are known to have a lower limit that can't be smaller than. <clears throat> and that range is getting tighter and tighter from the high end that's coming in, from the low end that's coming in, and we're eventually going to detect what the mass of the neutrino is. So I would say funding uh, a search to, uh, that has a legitimate chance to, say, detect the masses of the neutrinos for the first time, then I think it's, uh, I think it's incredibly worthy. If you say we're going to build an experiment uh, to maybe discover something that we weren't expecting, and I've heard scientists tell me this, we're going to build a huge telescope because who knows what we'll find. When Galileo turned his telescope to the sky, he didn't know what he was looking for. I don't think that's a good justification today. In an infinite budget world, that's one thing. Uh, similarly with a particle collider, we don't know, if we don't have a good target where we know the signal can't be smaller than something, 
I worry about funding that as well. And But I'm not an expert in the uh, probability assignment of how likely it is to find supersymmetry. I mean, she claims things like, uh, and, he, and Eric claims things like string theory and, uh, and supersymmetry are not only not possible to be proven, in other words, they're not falsifiable, but they're also not possible to really, you know, continue. In other words, you've seen everything that could possibly be of interest. And so now you're just kind of justifying this pursuit, according to them. I, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in these fields. But Eric's idea is, is a little bit deeper in that we really, uh, we should actually charge people for physics. So it's very controversial. So yeah. things that physicists have built, discovered, theorized that are used right now as we're talking, you know, the, the internet HTTP protocol was developed at CERN, uh, <clears throat> you know, long before the LHC. If we charge, uh, you know, a penny per instruction or website view, uh, that, and he claims, would be a way to recoup the debt that society owes to physicists. He actually said that. <laughs> Pay it back, man. Okay. Uh, well, I got. We're running out of time, and I have a question for you. But before I yeah. ask it, I, I want to let 10, me get. Minutes. I can okay. Go a little bit longer today, yeah. Okay. Well, Simon Farmer, who, by the way, is the one that he was right. He's the one that pointed out to me the cost of the LAC on a Twitch stream he did. Uh, he's asking you, Doctor Keating. Just as experiments have grown quite expensive, isn't it possible that theories ha that theories have grown too complex for a single mind? And Eric is just looking for help. Mm. That's very interesting. So what's um, what's different about theory rather than experiment <clears throat> is that you can't do an experiment anymore with just the lone genius working in her lab or whatever, right? You really can't do that anymore. I think that what we want to, uh, well, the difference in theory is there is still that mindset that you could be Paul Dirac, Richard Feynman, uh, Galileo, Einstein, you know, choose your favorite hero. <laughs> and you'll have all this glory and eventually win a Nobel Prize, right? That's part of the thesis of my book is that the Nobel Prize is leading physicists astray because it's it's really perpetuating this notion of history that's incorrectly portrayed by the victors of, you know, whoever wins a Nobel Prize, that's the way science is actually constructed. So I think I think it's 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 there are some extremely bright people in the world. And even people like like Ed Witten or Eric Weinstein, who feel inadequate maybe because they're not trained as physicists or trained as mathematicians in his case, he will look to somebody like Witten <clears throat> and he will say, you know, this is one of the greatest minds who's ever lived. And, and Eric is one of the greatest. I mean, he's incredibly brilliant. Whether you like him, dislike him, disagree. I mean, he can talk about anything from the organizational structure of some university in the 1960s in Europe. Uh, and then he can talk about like politics, you know, between two different factions of, you know, Andrew Yang and, and, and uh, Bernie Sanders, and it's just unbelievable how, how versatile he is intellectually. But just speaking in physics terms, I, I do hear the complaint, and I resonate with that, that he has yet to publish anything in a format that is remotely accessible to the average person. I'm going to give you guys a link to this really cool physics project thing that, that he's working on <clears throat> on his website called The Wall. Let's see if I can get that up. And he's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a representation of something that's, that's carved physically into the walls of the uh, Simons Institute for Geometry at uh, St State University of New York at Stony Brook, where I was born uh, and I grew up. <clears throat> and I will put that in the chat right now. And this wall that Eric's talking about is, uh, <clears throat> is really representing the culmination, the, the amazing contributions of all of uh, of all of knowledge, and here's here's a, a shout out. To, it's on my channel. I don't know if it's going out to your channel too, but yeah, I think it's. Okay. Um, so I just put it there. People can click on it. So if you click on it, it shows this wall, and you can click on the different equations in the wall. And this is really, you know, uh, a beautiful kind of representation of the most advanced creations of all of human civilization, according to uh, And I think it's quite wonderful. The question is, yeah, can any one person understand it? Yeah, of course. I mean, I can get about halfway down this list and I'm just a simple experimentalist. Um, now, can I make new contributions to it? I don't think so, but I can work to say, look at the middle equation, you know, the Dirac equation uh, with this weird capital D with a strike through it. I don't know, are you looking at this, Tony? No, I'm not, because I didn't. it didn't come through on oh, my chat, have, so I've got okay. too many other we'll windows open. Yeah. I'll, I'll put it on. I'll put it on all the chats. Yeah. But, the, uh, but the important thing is you've got this amazing creation, 
and uh, and a human mind can not only carve it into the wall, but a human mind can understand it. The question is, can you contribute something new that's missing from this wall? That's a deeper question. And, um, you know, you can't order up serendipitous discoveries. They come when they come. And by nature, these, these discoveries, most of them are serendipitous. Like we didn't expect from the get-go that the universe uh, would manifest gravity via curvature of space-time or else Isaac Newton, whose law is up there, uh, would have had a very different construction of his law. Okay, well, I want to ask you about, yeah. since we... I do think it's possible with single people. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I want to uh, talk about theory of everything, since that's in the title of this uh, uh, Hangout, and I'm, I'm sure you... you uh, oh, you just went away. Oh, man, where'd you go? Uh, okay, so he uh, he just left my Hangout. <laughs> um, no, I don't have... Uh, uh, we're not on a Zoom meeting. I've got him in my uh, Wirecast uh, program uh, as a guest, and so he can't share a screen here. Um, and he just dropped out. So hopefully he'll he'll come back in uh, in just a minute. I would like to comment though. Uh, let me just read Simon's uh, comment. My takeaway from your interview with Eric was that he acknowledges there really is an elite within the physics community, and that that they'd be better off looking at his theory than string theory it yeah it might be a certain sort of sour grapes there um in, in some respect but i want to go i want to talk about just a little bit i want to make a comment on the serendipitous nature of science um that's really we tend to gloss over that this this idea that you know the way in which science is advan is advancing <laughs> if you think about it it's not really based on science itself is it how do these theories get uh, generated in the first place? Do they come from any sort of uh, uh, rational uh, world? Sometimes, sure. By looking at the world, we can make hypotheses and we can and we can uh, build up um, theories based on what we see around the world. But a lot of it is based on creativity, and a lot of it is based on um, and, you know just just imagination. And that is a very those are very non scientific things. And I bring that up because. You know, we the science depends on things that are not necessarily scientific for its success, and this and these theories are an example. What I was going to ask Brian was about this idea: as if he really it, does, there have to be a theory of everything. Does the entire does everything we know about the universe have to be distilled into an a t-shirt equation right an equation that'll fit on a t-shirt you know do we do is this a real goal for physics does it, i mean it's something that, hu, that in our human minds we are predisposed to thinking would be nice you know it, it's like it, it's it's aesthetically pleasing to the human mind but there's no there's no requirement, I think, that there be a theory of everything. One theory from which everything sprouts may not be the way the universe is. And I've always been confused by this need, this drive to link relativity to quantum mechanics or things like that. I, I think that all of these laws are valid and they work in a, in a regime in which they're relevant, right? Quantum mechanics is in a certain, works in a certain regime. Newtonian mechanics is, is relevant in a certain regime. And then up to where it's not really very accurate, relativity takes over and does a very wonderful job. I have been wondering lately about this idea of what's past relativity. There must be something more beyond relativity that before we get to a theory of everything. And I'm I so Nothing's changed. The link is the same, Brian. <laughs> uh, let me see if he's, he's probably emailed me. No, let me just say. What happens when you click on the link? You're watching me send emails. Isn't this fun? Who says the internet isn't the best ever? Okay. Anyway, he should be able to just jump right back in. Nothing's changed. I don't know how he got disconnected. Uh, 
Okay, well, I'm keeping a lookout for him and see if he jumps back in. Sorry, Brian, don't know what happened there. You got thrown out, and just as I was about to ask my question. Um, so Junior Balls is commenting, I have listened to a lot of Eric, and he had some real issues within the academic world himself, which is why he sat on his work for so long. Um, add to that the problems his brother had at Evergreen, um, dot, dot, dot. Okay. Simon wants to know, I'd really, actually really, I'd like to know your opinion on what he said about building bigger telescopes. I think we'll, we know we'll see new things with bigger telescopes. Um, yeah, that's very true. Saltu, my two cents. I think science should be done with a worldwide network, not, and not only for science. A network uh, should be able to connect to an other networks as they need. Lone Wolf is just slow. Yes, but I actually think I've got a point here with um, this this business of uh, lack of progress. <laughs> yes, okay. So Brian says, yeah, we've had some we've had some stuff happen since the seventies or the last fifty years. You know, there was been a few breakthroughs uh, here and there in physics. But they aren't next level stuff, right? I mean, what happened in the early 20th century was just, you know, it was a watershed of new discoveries. So I'm, um, I'm very uh, disappointed that 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 hasn't really continued much. And I blame a lot of it on the culture of science, right? This idea that uh, this good old boy network of who you know and the theories that are currently in favor are the ones that are going to get listened to at the expense of all these other theories. And then these really expensive experiments need to be built in order to prove these theories uh, really hamper science. And I just wonder, I think that I think science has become a lot less productive from a theoretical standpoint than it has uh, from an experimental standpoint. It has boomed experimentally. Technology has gone to a place where we can now see things we could never hope to see before. And it has cost a lot of money to do that, for sure. Gravitational waves, we looked for decades before we finally saw them. Um, the same with the finding the Higgs boson. We built a, this big multi-billion dollar uh, super collider to do it. And we saw it finally. And now the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be launched at $9 billion. Uh, w first, or the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is going to be done. I can't believe I remembered that. I'm really proud of myself. Um, it's going to be launched at probably half that cost. <laughs> Who knows, really, what it's going to cost when it finally launches. Uh, but all of these telescopes, we're talking multi-billion dollar efforts here. And so science is getting very expensive. And is it still a good value? It's a question I think that you should ask. Um, to me, if you ask me, of course it's a good value. Always science is a good value, especially just because of you know how successful it's been in our understanding of the universe. And I do think that we need a theory that goes past relativity because um, we need to explain singularities, right? We The singularities that exist in our universe, black holes and the Big Bang, those kinds of singularities are a problem for our current uh, physical framework. And we have to have answers for these. You know, we can't have an event horizon beyond which our physics stops working. There's something fundamentally missing there that we need to figure out, right? There's gotta be a theory that we can plug in that says, oh yeah, black holes are areas where light doesn't uh, can't get out. And if you go into one, then we have to invoke this new theory that is superseding or on top of or in addition to relativity that does explain the things relativity can't. And my thinking goes like this, and I've done this on, on Twitch several times, but you know, Copernicus was right up to a point about, you know, the solar system and, uh, along comes Kepler and, um, uh, uh, Newton and they, they flesh out the, the, the framework a little bit more. They're a little bit more right than Copernicus and Galileo were. And now we've got a bigger, more accurate framework. And then, but that only worked up to a certain point beyond which we needed relativity to kick in and um, tell us what's going on in the universe. And then of course there was the very small stuff, which quantum mechanics took care of and does a decent job. I don't see this need to connect the two, but let, you know, I'm not very smart compared to some of these other people who do think that, so I'll defer to them. But relativity has holes in it too, and not the least of which are these singularities. Relativity can't explain them. 
We, it has nothing to say past the event horizons, so we need something to invoke that does fix it. And so we are, at best, incomplete in our understanding of the universe, for sure, but whether we're ever going to get a theory of everything, especially one that fits on a t-shirt, I just don't, I just don't see the need for it. I don't, I, I'm not driven for that. I'm driven for, to this idea of understanding what we, you know, filling in the holes of things that we don't understand. And we have a lot of holes. We're nowhere done by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so let's see, Raj is, hey Raj, uh, NASA has an idea of building a telescope in one of the craters on the moon. Yes. Good idea. Let's do it. Oh, I think he just emailed me. Let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Nope. I don't see his email. Oh yeah, there it is. It says waiting to be let in. Oh, there you are. Okay. There you are. So now I see you appearing. Hold tight and I shall add you in. Uh, let's see. Stand by. Sorry, I've got to do this quickly. Um, Are you there, Brian? Are you there? Hello? I hear you. Yep, I can hear you. All right. Um, there you go. I, I just I just I just fixed you. Sorry about that. Don't know what happened. But uh you're back now. And so I'm glad you're back. Yeah. I hope you still got some time. I know we've we've gone you know, yeah, past I got five more minutes. Five yeah. more minutes. Okay. Yeah. My, my theory, my question to you about theory of everything. I was just making this point that I don't see why we need to make this big theory of everything that connects, say, relativity to quantum mechanics and have this real nice t-shirt uh, sized equation that we can say describes everything. But do... It, do you feel that way? Do you th do you feel like that the that there is a theory that will connect all of the current theories that don't connect? And how important is that? Do you or, or do you think of something else? Yeah, that's an awesome that's an awesome question, and I'm glad that you were the one to ask it because that means I can a not answer it, and you'll get mad at me. Um, <laughs> the, the the issue, you know, it's like they say, uh, you know. Uh, physics needs physicists to come up with theories of everything the way that birds need ornithology ornithologists. You know, it's like, do we need it? Does it, uh, is it important? What would it do? So you can arguably make the case that um, Newton's theory was certainly much more simple than Aristotle's theory of motion or even Galileo's theory I was of just motion. making that point. And yes. that actually is all the math that you need to get to the moon. Yeah. So, so do we need it? No, I don't think we need any of it. I think we benefit from it. I think it's it's an aspect of culture of the human mind that is uh, insatiable that we will continue to look for it. And why is it a theory of everything? Yeah. So, the reason that happens is that we we know that there are four forces of nature. We know that there aren't so-called hidden variables or strange aspects of um, of quantum mechanics that are inaccessible to our experiments. You know, we know that the properties that we know about are, you know, represent the sum total of things that at least can interact with the physical world. And when we write down a single equation, we can actually write down a single equation already. And we can even write down a single equation that encapsulates all of physical theories plus gravity, as long as gravity is classical. In other words, you can write down all of quantum mechanics and you can write down all of classical gravity and you can marry those two together. Now, the problem is when you try to go to quantum gravitational systems, if indeed gravity is quantum, um, quantum quantizable, 
uh, then you would have a theory of everything. Like that is what would constitute a theory of everything. Okay. And because of our need to kind of make, I, I call it a hack. Like people want to simplify and have a shortcut. You know, it's like lose weight. You know, uh, I'll show you this one weird trick, you know, that bypasses all the 40 years plus of, of eating. That, no, we want a one simple trick that fits on the wall, on the t-shirt, on the whatever. But that's a hack, right? Why do you need that? You don't actually sit there and at the end of the day and say, I'm going to turn on my computer. Let me apply the Dirac equation. <laughs> no, but it's more about understanding. Let, what let me convert mass into things. energy by using the speed of light, I, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I think it's part of the human mind, just like, you know, writing a great American novel, right? Uh, that's, that's a goal. Like, is there such a thing? No, of course not. Yeah, that doesn't okay. stop people. And I think it's a good goal to have as long as it's done in moderation. As long as we don't say, Let's fund a billion people to keep doing this. There, there has to be a limit. Actually, one of my friends, who's a, a phenomenally accomplished astronomer, I won't say his name, but but he basically thinks we have too many postdoctoral, you know, fellowships. Like we're actually encouraging people to go into a field where there's no terminal point. And even today, I was talking to Sabine uh, Hassenfelder, who's a very accomplished scientist and author, best-selling author, columnist, you know, all these things. Uh, tens of hundreds of thousands of fans. Her YouTube channel is phenomenal. And we should talk about her in about two weeks. Okay. She doesn't have a permanent job. She doesn't work in the orthodox mainstream of, of her field. And, um, you know, and I think she's, it's not for lack of knowledge. She understands it as well as anybody. So do we have an obligation to uh, maybe, uh, you know, try to ch channel more people into experimental physics? I would like that personally. Me too. Um, and, and do we have an obligation to fund really uh, high, high risk, high reward value? The reason that Eric said we should charge every you know, penny per semiconductor, you know, because semiconductors were invented by theoretical uh, physicists and experimentalists as well, is because he wants to fund the, uh, experiment, uh, theoretical physics. But you can say that, and I can agree with you, but how do you actually get it done? I don't think anyone's going to pay a tax on each email, and nor do I think that would be good. So it's a nice LEDs the same way. Makes, LEDs were a solid state yeah. physics guy, right? So yeah. Lasers. Yeah, yeah lasers. Lasers, that's right. masers, radar, light. I mean, the list of physics accomplishments <laughs> is tremendous. That's and, right. Yeah. You know, the question is, how do we do that? How do we get more theoretical um, blood into the field? That is an open question. I think I think some of it is maybe lessening the, the prestige of these prizes like the breakthrough prize, the Nobel Prize. Let's take that money and make twenty different postdoc fellowships and give uh, tenure, you know, have more tenure track faculty in the theoretical sciences. Uh, I, I think that that's interesting things to, to pursue. And, and now, I don't know if you saw this, but the National Science Foundation, they're proposing that it'll include technology. And so it'll be perhaps even less connected to the pure basic scientific research that I, that I do and others do. Yeah. I just worry that the, the working for a theory of everything as a goal uh, is a little bit of um, you know, wasted energy because I think if there is in fact a theory of everything that is the truth of the universe, that it will come out in whatever path we end up taking to get there. So while we're answering other mysteries or we're not being so focused on trying to find the theory that explain that links gravity and a quantum level or whatever, that we're looking at these other um, uh, ideas that we're trying to figure out in the universe that we're going to get there anyway. If it really is one theory that does everything, then we're going to find it inevitably just by doing uh, honest investigations into the universe. So I just worry that it's wasted effort. Well, this yeah. doesn't come, this doesn't come, you know, connect. And so, but maybe it's valuable in another way. That's my only real worry about this. And I, and um, Adam Synergy just made a comment of does physics have to be beautiful? I mean, that's a really valid question. It do, does it have to end up being elegant, you know, or, 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 you know, fit on a t-shirt. So, um, these are all things I worry might be a bit of a distraction. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it sounds like, you know, um, we, that you think that it's, it's getting there, uh, is, yeah. is worthwhile. We should be looking for this theory of, of everything. Um, and while we go along, it sounds like. Yeah, I think I think your Adam will like this podcast I did with, with um, Sabine because she made, that's the name of her book, Lost in Math, how mathematics and beauty lead physics astray. And she claims that fascination, obsession with beauty and symmetry and so forth and reduction to uh, these elegant universe type statements. And she's really a vocal opponent of people like Brian Greene and, 
and you know, kind of flowerly Lang and maybe even Sean Carroll types like that. Right. Um, so I want to see what your audience would like to see more. Uh, so I've had uh, some hopes to. So I'm going to have a second part with Eric. People um, are, are interested in that. That's going to come out hopefully on Father's Day uh, on Sunday. We did a special episode with Sasha Sagan for Mother's Day, so I right. thought it was only right we do one with Eric about his fatherhood and, and also being a scientist a mentor. Some of his controversial statements about places like Harvard and mentors in this field, uh, that'll launch on Father's Day, so stay tuned for that. He actually asked me, well, what about getting you know Sean Carroll, yes. uh, Stephen Wolfram, and Eric on the pod, on my podcast at the same time? I've had all three of them on. Whoa. Uh, what do people think about that? Uh, yeah. well, Dude, would- uh, no, they don't even ask. They're all going to say yes to that. That would be amazing. Okay. Yeah, that would be. If you <laughs> okay. could do that, do that. That would be an outstanding uh, panel to have on a, as a discussion. So, yeah. Well, yeah. what you guys could do out there is, is kind of convince I'm you know, speaking for subscribe you guys. to their podcast. Yeah. So please uh, and, and ch- chat with them and tell them that's what you guys want. You guys want a, uh, a, a three way, com- four way conversation on my podcast with Wolfram Weinstein and Carol and, uh, and anyone else you can think about uh, yeah. in these zoom crazy times. Maybe it, maybe it can happen. Zoom crazy. Yeah. Well, I, I know you gotta right, go. Tony, can, well, I just, oh, can I just get to, to one? Maybe we'll talk. Oh, yeah. you got to go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just uh, Neil, you. I just, oh, no, just I get to Neil's go question. Go He's go got. Um, do you think that um, AI oh, yeah. will solve anything for us soon in physics? What about the role of artificial intelligence in physics? And then I'll let you go. So I'm hoping to have on a friend of mine, Max Tegmark, who's who's kind of the opposite side of of Sabine, where he's you know purely has this mathematical universe uh, that would be uh, you know really startlingly opposed by people like Sabine. That, Basically, everything is just pure mathematics, and every every atom, every electron is the same as any other atom or electron. It's all just a numerical, uh, you know, representation of reality. So uh, he wrote another book called Life 3.0 that I reviewed in uh, Physics Today. So I'll put a link to that in the uh, notes right now. But that um, that art that book really states, you know, the case he's trying to come up with a, what we call the AI physicist, and the AI physicist will. You know, because it will learn about, like, it will discover Newton's laws, for example, by looking at data. And, and he's shown that it will happen or in certain things in thermodynamics. The problem is uh, it may only be able to say things about things we already know about. Uh, and so I, I would like to uh, have him on the podcast to talk about that exact same question. That's a good point. What would yeah. an AI physicist do that's novel? And, Neil, I think that's what you're getting at. What yeah. novel creation, uh, or is that unique to the human mind? I think that's a fascinating that um, is that is a, a that is subject. that would be a fascinating question for sure because I was just trying to make the point that science depends a lot on things like creativity and imagination to progress and so it would be if if an AI can do this work that's right. uh, without any of those things then there goes my theory right there so um, that that would be an outstanding discussion to hear so okay Brian thank you I know you got to okay, go guys. don't forget to hit the end stream Bye, on your channel because I'm about to ramble. And oh, so, yeah. and so, you That's probably right. don't want that on your channel. So, uh, uh, thank. I'll see you next week, right? Maybe, right? No. All right. Yes, let's do okay. next week right. for sure, guys. It's great. Oh, wait, Always wait. love talking to you guys. Okay. Yeah, we'll see you next week. All right. Talk to you later. Bye bye. Okay. All right. So I think. Let me just uh, look at. A